And now, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Greg Lestoka, the moderator for the first discussion. Professor Lestoka uh, is at Rutgers Camden and co-director of the Rutgers Institute for Information uh, Policy and Law. And he is a gaming law expert. So, Professor. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting uh, me and everyone else here today. This looks like it's going to be a fantastic uh, 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 event. This is the kind of event I would put together if I could put together an event. Um, so I'm uh, talking about the video game uh, and uh, UGC uh, issues with um, some uh, distinguished uh, guests today. Um, Immediately to my right is uh, John uh, Festinger, uh, who is uh, hails from Vancouver, uh, our friend of the North, um, and uh, he is on the faculty at the Center for Digital Media, as well as the Faculty of Law at the University of uh, British Columbia. Um, he has been in private practice uh, in uh, uh, intellectual property law and media law for uh, two uh, decades, uh, currently. Uh, uh, um, continuing to practice uh, as uh, uh, an intellectual property law um, uh, and video game expert. Uh, he has um, uh, basically uh, multiple hats, but he's uh, most importantly for, for our purposes the uh, author of uh, the um, video game law uh, handbook published by uh, Lexis uh, in 2005. And the second edition of uh, video game law was published in 2012. Uh, I've read it. It's wonderful guide to all aspects of, of video game law. Um, to John's right is uh, uh, Mark uh, Mentonitis, who is uh, currently a transactional attorney with Metro uh, PCS Wireless. Um, uh, he also uh, is an expert in uh, video game law. You might be familiar with his blog, The Law of the Game. I know I am and many of my students are uh, as well. Uh, the Law of the Game was uh, featured as one of the American Bar Association's top 100 legal blogs. Um, he's been published uh, in many uh, uh, distinguished journals. He's also the co-chair of the International Game Developers Association chapter uh, in Dallas and is the current chair of the American Bar Association's uh, science and technology section on uh, virtual worlds and multi-user uh, online games. Um, so. Uh, the plan is uh, that we were going to uh, have two presentations. Uh, John's going to start uh, with a 15-minute presentation, uh, and then, then Mark will have uh, his, his presentation for 15 minutes, and then we'll have a, uh, a short discussion, and then we'll open it up to, to everyone for, uh, for your input. So uh, thanks a lot, and let's start. It's an honor to be here. Um, for those of you who are students and interested in the subject of video game law, I've basically put everything from my UBC video game law course uh, online. You'll see the HTTP blogs entry there um, and all the lectures and many of the guest speakers and most of the materials are there. It's an honor to be here um, and when talking about blogs, um, I have to start with my personal experience. Why am I interested in this area? And where does somebody who really started out as a, what you would think of as a First Amendment lawyer, as a newsroom lawyer for the first chunk of my career, um, how do I come to be passionate about video game law? How do I become passionate about laws in particular? So the, the story is really about a game called Rock Free Legends. I probably learned to read by reading Road and Track magazine and Carcraft and things like that. And in 1997, a, a PC game was introduced that had revolutionary physics. Instead of having the car tilt on its center axis, it actually introduced the notion that cars had four wheels and that the physics model for a car racing game should introduce that rather obvious element and play the physics off of each of the four bits. Awesome technology. Couple of issues. One, it was a game that was meant to be an accurate recreation of the 1967 Formula One Grand Prix season. So perhaps not the most sensational. friendly game that ever was, except in the minds of the developers. 
and it had very, very high technological requirements. You couldn't play the game with a real pedal set. You had to have um, a very advanced um, uh, video card, um, and it was all very cutting edge. And if you tried to play the game on any kind of normal PC, you got about six frames a second, which uh, those of you who are gamers know won't work. The, the wonderful thing was that the game showed enough strength that Papyrus went on to acquire the NASCAR license, reuse the physics, and produced a whole series of very successful games. But this game was not successful. It was very low reviewed in the 60s by PC Magazine. What happened was a community developed around the game. A very passionate community. A community that built multiplayer. A, a, a community that took the original art of the game, which is at the bottom, and turned it to what's at the top. And a community that was creative, sometimes crazy. Um, there were 300 page threads on the accuracy of the Monza racetrack and little mini mods to make sure that each of the signs of Monza <coughs> were in the right place. And it was obsessive and it was fun. And sometimes it had magic moments, like one, one evening I remember being on my computer and somebody wandering onto the forums and saying, you know, my dad, who is very ill right now, um, drove in one Formula One race or one race that was related to Formula One in New Zealand in 1967, could someone recreate his car? And within moments, the leaders of the community, and if you were on the forums, you knew who they were. I contributed nothing. There were people who contributed a great deal. Jumped in, took the conversation offline, and you knew it was done. So, Grand Prix Legends, went from 1997 to 2010 probably is a really active and amazing game uh, with a fairly large community. Uh, I took it off my hard drive last year. Let's think about modding a little bit more broadly for a second. What are we doing here? Everything you do in law school What's the cardinal sin? The car, well, the, the real cardinal sin is plagiarism. The other cardinal sin, I'll say this for my students who may be watching uh, back in Vancouver, don't, you don't submit your paper with inadequate citations, please. You're building on the work of others. That's what you learn here. That's what education is. That's also what law is. We build on precedent. We build on the work of others. And there's a series of cases, um, some of which are in Canada. I don't know what the American precedents are. But where, where people have tried to argue that uh, their submissions should be protectable by, by copyright law. That their particular kind of argument uh, should somehow be protected. Uh, that copying in a law library case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada um, uh, should, uh, should be protectable. And, and user rights and notions of user rights were the, were the court's answers in all of those circumstances. So what happens? Why, why are mods an issue? If you look a little bit deeply, more deeply, I think you'll see there are two notions of what creativity is. And the first is very, very deeply built into our society and in fact comes right from the beginning of the Bible. And God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. The first creativity had 
all sorts of this is mine. This is like me. It. So, I have a quote from an actor and a producer I really like, and that's why I've not named him. Um, but the apotheosis of this notion is, I think, this quote. The creative is a place where no one else has ever been. You have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition. What you'll discover will be wonderful. What you'll discover is yourself. So creativity is yours, belongs to you, is deeply personal. And that is one me. That is one way of looking creativity. The research and the current academic thinking and a lot of good quotes takes us, takes us in a very different direction. That creativity is not that unique and uniquely personal thing that it is shared, and it comes from shared sources. And as Nina Paley says, all creative work is derivative. So, another problem, and Mark alludes to this in what he will take us through to some extent, is, that, is the idea expression dichotomy that you will have faced in law school. Hopefully your intellectual property course. And you know there is no intellectual property in an idea. Protection comes from the expression of the idea. Well, a long time ago, private ideas, public expression, were relatively anonymous. But today, by virtue of this webcast, by virtue of tweeting this. Fixation comes very, very quickly. And we're out of balance. And that's part of the conundrum. So the discussion today, I think, where Greg will take us in part, is how do we rebalance? And where I'm going to try and take you is that modding is part of, and machinima and creative rights and the right to create may be part of the solution. Now there's a third, more difficult conundrum, and this one is taking me a long while to figure out. And don't, don't feel like you should know what the Mrs. Smith principle is, because I invented it and only my law students know what it is. I used to be a newsroom lawyer for many, many years. And the classic phone call you would get after a controversial story, and you get it from both sides of the political spectrum, went something like this. I watched your ridiculous, dishonest, completely incorrect and non-factual story on the news tonight. I saw it for the garbage that it was. But it's not me I'm worried about. It's Mrs. Smith down the street. She's far too dumb and unable and, and infirm of mind to understand that what you were telling her was nonsense. She will think it is true. And in that kind of Mrs. Smith notion, might, I might suggest, is kind of the human heart of censorship. I get it, but you don't. Part of what's happening, perhaps, when we look at mods, is a version of this principle where we will acknowledge our own creativity, but we have a hard time acknowledging other people's creativity. Everyone in this room thinks they're creative. You know why? Because you are. Because it goes to the very heart of being human. But be honest, and you'll know, you have a hard time acknowledging the creativity of your neighbor, the next law student, the next professor. 
It's human. But I'm not saying it's wrong, except when we build legal principles around it. So now we arrive at the belly of the beast, and I'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly. Where do we find the answers? So, one, and again, the newsroom lawyer in me comes out. And originally I was a litigator for a while, so I, I looked at these things and argued them. And one thing that commends itself for your consideration is think about what happened before the first copyright act. You will know that the first copyright act was the statute of Anne in 1710 in the United Kingdom. I know being in the United States, we don't necessarily want to acknowledge anything that's British. But, um, there we go. We did win. Canada did win the War of 1812. <laughs> Let's go before. The Star Chamber, which exercised the core rights of censorship in England, was abolished in 1641. Censorship went to the king, then went to Parliament in 1643, and despite a wonderful speech to the British Parliament from John Milton called Areopaginica, which if you are a freedom of expression lawyer, you must read, remained a parliamentary privilege. And then there was a licensing of the Press Act sometime later, and we moved to a regulatory regime and then a self-regulation regime. All of this should seem fairly familiar to you if you think about video games where there is a self-regulatory regime in place. And then it moved to the statute of it. So the question is, can you understand copyright as part of the trajectory of freedoms? Can you think of copyright and moving the control of the work in the, sen in the censorship context, where control of the work first belonged to the king, then to parliament, then to an industry regulatory body, then to the industry itself, and finally to the author. But in 1710, that's pretty well all we had. We didn't have notions of users facilitated by digital tools like we have today. So we've essentially been stuck in terms of our larger concepts at 1710. So now let's go specifically to the cases. And there isn't time to go through them in detail. But I would argue that if you look at them closely, they neither allow nor prohibit one. I'll add one word, creative one. And by that word hangs a lot. The most difficult of the cases, to me, the very, uh, is a case that's not read very much called I Racing and Robinson. Uh, but it's fat, it, it can easily be narrowed in any number of ways to a very particular set of facts. Uh, the case that on its face would give the most difficulty is the Court of Appeal decision in Davidson and, and Internet Gateway, which is the PNED case. And that's where I want to go now. Hopefully, if I do this right, I, oh. I need to right. Sorry. I need to get to the right. But there was no, I didn't have the technological acumen to, uh, to cue this up properly. Can you? Yeah. Oh. 
I should be able to do it for you. All right. We may have to listen a little bit. This is the respondent acting on behalf of Blizzard in the Court of Appeal. Coming in about a minute. I'll tell you what it is. does not involve new creation. There may be a case that does. This isn't it. So the most powerful precedent, and this is really the key to the case, argues that the mod in, BN, in BNetD, which was replicating an online functionality for Blizzard games, had nothing creative about it. So why would you say that? You'd say that because you'd be afraid of the implications if there was something creative in it. Mods are creative, at least the kinds of mods we're talking about. They're not plagiarists. The modding in Grand Prix Legends was incredibly creative and obsessive and kind of crazy. So, assume that I've convinced you a little bit. How would you move the ball forward on modding? You could argue that there should be no protection for games. There's a wonderful article by Bruce Boyden, which I've referred to up there that reminds us that games, not video games, are not copyrightable. You could raise the threshold for IP protection, which some learned academics have argued should be done in England. In other words, copyright protection is a two-level level. Make it tougher. That will allow for the use and reuse of important material. You could go the way of the Canadian Supreme Court and just broaden user rights. Or my particular favorite is imagine what the world would look like if Sony versus Universal, the time shifting case, didn't exist today. And what we're looking for is a new context for time shifting. Call it context shifting in the digital age. All of which may lead us in the direction of a right to create, whether it's a standalone right or a user right in defense to copyright. All of those, at least at this point, seem like a pretty good idea to a dedicated Grand Prix Legends player and the father of a very creative 11 year old girl who painted that painting. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Methanitis, and as we've already kind of gone through my bio, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so instead, in the spirit of this being a TED style talk, I want to start somewhere probably no one is expecting. And that would be with a high school chemistry refresher with our dear friend Walter White. Um, 
as you may recall from your high school chemistry, one of the things you probably had to do was learn to balance chemical equations. As my high school teacher always told us, what goes in has to equal what comes out. Um, and it's my opinion that this is sort of one of the key components to intellectual property law, and I know a lot of others share this ideal, that intellectual property law at its core is a balancing act. Um, depending on what type of intellectual property you're talking about, you're talking about different balancing acts or different rights in the bundles of rights may have different balances to strike, whether that's producer versus other producer, producer versus consumer, um, producers versus prosumers, inventors versus other inventors, and of course there's everything against the public interest. Just as an example, if you look at copyright, um, the producer has obviously exclusive rights over the work that are for a set duration of time, and they have statutory damages to assist with what is often the difficult prospect of proving up the actual damages they may have incurred by someone infringing. On the other side of the equation, the consumer has rights like fair use, uh, first sale, and of course there's the grand balance, the public domain, that everything eventually, theoretically, um, should get to if we ever stop extending copyright. Of course, copyright law, as we mentioned before, stems back to an analog reality, you know, when we had physical media. And with the original works of things that were copywritten, paintings, sculptures, you're talking about, to replicate, you need a master craftsman who has an immense amount of time available to them to reproduce these works, you know, bit by bit, piece by piece. Um, the printing press was one of the first things that sort of struck a little bit of fear in producers, but still, you're talking about something that was a huge barrier to entry. Printing presses were not inexpensive machines. Creating the individual plates that were used to then press those pages was a time-consuming endeavor. It was not something that, you know, sort of the everyman could do. Uh, as we move forward, even with sort of more readily copyable technology like the cassette tape um, or the photocopier, you still had the problem of that original would degrade over time. And so the idea of something being infinitely replicable with no loss of quality didn't exist until we hit digital media. Um, of course, when we got to the digital age, you're still talking about a relatively high opportunity cost of storage. And, of course, distribution was still physical. You had to send that, you know, five and a half or three and a quarter floppy, di floppy disk over to somebody else. You couldn't just instantly transfer it to them. Of course, the Internet has compounded all of that. Um, we now have not only the ability to make infinite identical copies, no loss of quality, with really the only band, uh, limitation being bandwidth and storage, which are now ridiculously inexpensive. Um, this, of course, creates something that's a common uh, analogy in um, the copyright law, that being the double-edged sword. On the one hand, if you're a producer, especially an up-and-coming producer, it is now exponentially easier to get your product out to whoever the end user is, um, but at the same time, you also have exponentially more risk of piracy, and that's something that is definitively not slowed down. For consumers, you get the same sort of two-way street. On the one hand, a lot more content is available to the extent the producers make it available, um, and of course, there's the high lure of piracy on the other side of that. Uh, one of the recent examples that's been really popular is the Game of Thrones example that was even the subject of an oatmeal comic, where for those not familiar, HBO, when they launched uh, Game of Thrones, the TV show based on the George R.R. R. Martin books, um, was very, very popular, but the only way to get it was to subscribe to HBO, which meant you also had to subscribe to cable, which is probably a hundred plus dollar endeavor on a monthly basis. Um, lots of people wanted to be able to watch Game of Thrones, but they had no way to do so. And so they, what a lot of people kept saying was, HBO, please take my money. I just want to watch Game of Thrones. And uh, it, to date, still you really can't do that. The episodes are usually held almost a full year after they're made available, although with the second season they did decide to release them digitally at the same time as the discs. So it reduced the barrier some. But you see this exact problem of if the producer doesn't take advantage of these opportunities as they're available, then the consumer may start doing something else. And of course, there are more things that keep compounding the complexity of the balancing in this equation. Um, one is the first sale doctrine, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which was definitively complicated about two years ago with the Autodesk decision. Um, 
that decision essentially said that software was subject to a license and was not necessarily subject to the first sale doctrine. In this case, it was a number of copies of Autodesks that a uh, person who had bought them was trying to resell, and that was prohibited by the license, and the court actually upheld that. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this actually makes it all the way to the Supreme Court at some point, because the uh, Kurt Sang decision that just came out a couple weeks ago uh, shows that the high court does actually have a um, you know, pretty high opinion of first sale. They actually held against some publishers who were trying to prevent the import of works that were produced outside the U.S., saying that first sale should be limited by region. Uh, and the court said, no, first sale is first sale. Once a physical copy is out there, it's out there. Um, referencing back to what we were talking about before with barriers to entry, as I mentioned, that ease of distribution is at an all-time high. And you know, to just illustrate exactly how big a difference this has made, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Machinima Red vs. Blue. Uh, they're about to celebrate their 10-year anniversary here this coming Monday. When they first came out in April 2003, the only way to distribute a video file over the Internet was to literally upload a QuickTime file to the Internet and let people download it. And uh, one of the stories that creators like to tell is uh, that once they actually had to start shopping for bandwidth, which was pretty quick, um, their first month bandwidth bill was in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and that's for a new something that had just gotten a little bit of Internet popularity. Um, now, you can go on Blip TV today for no cost and be getting a rev share from day one off the advertising revenue from something that's streaming that takes a fraction of that bandwidth. And so it's, on the one hand, allows people who don't necessarily have the means to be able to otherwise distribute it get out there, but on the other hand, also pre creates a very easy means for infringement. Um, the secondary component, and this relates to something I'll discuss later, is it is now exponentially easier to create a professional-looking product using something that would be consumer-available. Uh, if you're talented enough, you could probably go out and look, create a game that looks just like any other professional game, go out and even create an animated feature that may look as nearly as professional as a Pixar or a Disney piece. Um, the difficulty there is that you start to get to whether or not things that might be relying on other works are distinguishable from their original work. And we'll get to that here in a minute. Of course, the final piece is that statutory damages remain unchanged, and this is a common discussion point. Um, with uh, statutory damages being what they are, you've seen a number of very, very high verdicts against people for sharing a handful of audio files. And there's long been the question of whether those statutory damages are so out of whack with reality um, that perhaps they need to be revisited. Of course, if you're currently a prosumer, someone who is a consumer who also produces, you can currently work within the existing boundaries, and that really boils down to content usage rules. Um, again, referencing our dear friends Rooster Teeth, um, you probably have them to thank for there even being content usage rules. Microsoft was the first out of the gate with this a couple of years ago, uh, and I th really think it traces entirely back to the success and the quality that came out of Red vs. Blue, something that did start for the first three episodes with no permission from Microsoft or Bungie whatsoever. Uh, they were contacted after the fact and have since worked out a license. So it proves that those licenses do exist, but for everybody else who perhaps doesn't have those kind of connections or that kind of luck, um, you're stuck with these content usage rules that say, you can create something with our work if you follow these rules and you're not making any money off of it. So, yes, it's an opportunity to get exposure, but on the other hand, it's not truly the kind of, um, I think, regime some people would want, where you might even be able to get a flat licensing fee to be able to create derivative works from certain kinds of existing works. Um, you know, this always ties back to the golden rule. If you're making gold off something, everybody else wants to make sure they get their cut, too. So if we're talking about re reform in policy, reform in intellectual property, uh, one of the first places to stop is always source code. Um, source code, as you probably know, like sheet music, is independently copyrightable from the end work. This makes sense in music. In music, if you put a piece of sheet music out, three performers may make entirely different performances based on that same sheet music. This makes much less sense in software where the end compiled result should be identical all three times, no matter which compiling engine you're using. Um, so the question is, should we change the treatment of source code? I don't think we should throw out 
copyright protection for source code. But it does bear a question. If, for example, the original source code to Super Mario Brothers, now 20-something years old, were released today, would Nintendo see any net detriment from people using that source code to create derivative works? Obviously, they couldn't re-release Mario Brothers. That's still copyrighted. They'd have to do something else with it, and it could be a great learning opportunity uh, for people who are trying to learn how to code. Um, you know, similarly, id Software has actually done that and open sourced a number of their older engines just so that people can do things like that. Um, of course, this always leads into the question of open source. Um, and something that I've mentioned in you know, past articles is the idea of actually utilizing the Library of Congress, which certainly could use some more things to do, um, to keep a national open source registry rather than continuing to rely on these copy left uh, ideas that are you know, sometimes conflicting with one another. It depends on which license you're using. You have to go reference the license. If we had a true open source registry, you'd be able to say, this project is governed under whatever open source regulation we come up with for eternity. No question of ownership. Not to mention, we would be further promoting the science and useful arts by keeping what would likely be the biggest open source registry in the world. Um, similarly, it's a question of whether we should do the same thing with things in the public domain or even give people the ability, instead of registering a copyright, to register into the public domain perpetually at the point they register or perhaps have an automatic opt-out at some point in time. You know, different creators have different ideas of how long their things should be protected and giving them those kind of options within the statute um, would probably have a net positive effect. The last point I want to make um, takes a little bit of the big picture of the entertainment industry as it exists today. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that derivative works are probably a bigger revenue engine now than a lot of original works are. The, the franchise is what makes the difference, not necessarily the uh, original work itself. Um, similarly, we've had this compounding problem of copyright continuing to be extended for certain older works, um, and those you know, works have never fallen into the public domain. Uh, of course, again, with the barriers to entry like we discussed before, even if they were to fall into the public domain, you run into a, a unique problem um, that is pretty well illustrated by my friend Mickey Mouse here, who also happens to be one of the reasons for extending copyright, according to many sources. If you look at the left side of the screen, those are all registered trademarks of the Walt Disney Company. The right side of the screen are all copyrighted works featuring Mickey Mouse. There is no difference whatsoever between the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. And so if Steamboat Willie were to ever get into the public domain, it wouldn't matter. Disney's trademark lawyers would be all over you in 10 seconds if you ever tried to create a work using Mickey because immediately it would be associated with Disney. There is an almost inseparable element between the copyright and the trademark in certain characters and certain brands. And so the reform here, something that I wrote about uh, about a year ago, um, be the idea of creating some sort of a new hybrid IP between copyright and trademark. Um, obviously, it would have to have this inseparable element and would have to have some sort of a requisite fame and uh, time available in the public sphere such that not everybody could just immediately go down this road. It would have to be something proven up like Mickey. Um, the, I guess, catch to it is if you opt for moving from copyright to copy mark, you can get perpetual protection, but only as long as you continue to use it, much like a trademark. If you abandon it, everything would immediately fall to the public domain, and it's a one-way ticket. So it's essentially hedging a bet. As a creator, if you have something that falls into this, is it something that you want to bet on that you can keep going with so that you would actually get a longer use out of it than copyright? And I'm guessing a number of these bets will fail, and you will fall to the public domain much sooner. Uh, I, I think this is practically unlikely to happen unless we see a number of the lobbyist groups seen with no alternative. Uh, to the extent that we keep extending copyright, there's really no reason for them to look at something like this uh, unless it just happened to you know, tickle their fancy. It's not just Mickey, though. Um, there are lots of things right now that, if you say about a 25-year use, would already probably be el eligible to be a copy mark. Look at most of Marvel's catalog. Look at Star Wars. Even Mario is getting on in the years. Um, 
The Simpsons, The Muppets, Sesame Street, DC's catalog, Star Wars, and of course now half that slide is owned by Disney, so you know, they, they may be very much in favor of this in certain ways. Um, and time will tell if we end up seeing some other things move into that direction. Uh, some of our more popular recent video game characters, Harry Potter or Toy Story. Um, so the question is whether we can actually get anyone on board with reforming these things to improve them for a digital reality or whether we're just stuck trying to continue to muddle through with what we have. together. So there's a partnership in a game and built into the design of a video game that lends itself um, to further creation because even the act of gaming has creative elements in it. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. By the fact that it's interactive, the you know, consumer is already doing something creative just in playing the game. And it, as a time has evolved, it's become much more easy to share those creations. Um, whereas, you know, film, you couldn't really do anything more than just create your own film at this point. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and both of you talked about a need to... That there's a problem to a certain extent right now, uh, given digital distribution, uh, given the tools that are available. Um, and we need to find a new balance. Uh, and I guess... So one thing I'd, I'd ask uh, is, what do you see as being the kind of key policy elements behind a balance of UGC uh, and, and intellectual property rights in the game arena? You know, I think the one thing, when you're looking at this from a policy perspective, that everyone has to keep in mind is there is a practical limitation on how far we can go given the entertainment industry lobby. You know, we will never get to the sort of totally free, you know, utopia idea that so many people come to. That being said, we can certainly find a middle ground that's more um, palatable to everyone, perhaps, um, provided we can sort of nudge a few things off their current positions. You know, and, and it may be obvious, but I'm not sure that I see this entirely as a balancing act. You know, and I know being Canadian, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, the riddle, why did the Canadian chicken cross the road to get to the middle? On this one, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not actually that middle of the road. Um, it, it, it feels to me like when you are trying to balance a basic human characteristic, maybe one of the most basic human, if not the most basic human characteristic, creativity against property, it starts getting a little weird for me. The, the question is, how do you create a regime that encourages creativity in everybody? And I've got no issues and fully support all the things Mark, Mark talks about um, as middle grounds that get us to a better place. But until and unless we acknowledge a right of creativity that is either part of freedom of expression or a separate thing that can be asserted and cannot be simply contracted out of. I mean, the elephant in the room that we're not talking about is that all of, even the user rights that you might have can be wiped out 
basically without recourse, according to the BNET D case, um, uh, by an end user license agreement in terms of service. Something as fundamental as creativity is just gone because you've contracted out of it. So, you know, it's not a concept well known in the United States, but, uh, but there's a notion in Europe and in Canada of moral rights, um, which is not commercially based, but which follows um, uh, uh, abuses and misuses of somebody's creativity and tracks it that way that I'd like to see imported from a policy standpoint. Imported in the sense of a kind of moral right to access and moral right to use the property uh, in a way that's not right. like economic right. And, 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 well, that's separate from the economic right, but also a moral, there can be a moral right to block. The, the most famous Canadian moral rights case is Snow versus Eaton Center, where an artist uh, sold some ducks as a mobile to the Eaton Center in Toronto, and Eaton Center at Christmas time. He sold this work of art. The Eaton Center put little Santa caps uh, on, on, the, uh, on the mobile, and the artist successfully sued, saying, that's not what my art was for. Mm -hmm. So I, I have less objection to somebody saying, that's not what my art was for, than simply saying, well, you're making money off of this, or you're blocking my right to make money. Well, and that's really sort of the almost antithesis to what we get in the U.S., where, for example, there was the case over uh, Batman, which Batman was it? It was one of the bad Batmans, um, where there was a, a, a shot coming in over a building in Los Angeles that included a sculpture, and the sculptor wanted compensation for that being in the movie. Uh, the courts ruled that because it was physically attached to the building, he no longer had the rights to demand compensation for inclusion of his work because it was permanently affixed to the rest of the structure that was owned by somebody else. And we don't really have a very welcoming attitude to its moral rights, I think, for the most part, the United States. But I want to focus on another thing that you said. Um, copy, copyright in contracts uh, and the ability to waive fair use rights by submitting to an end user license agreements or terms of service. Increasingly, games are mobile, uh, online uh, networked, right? So we're assigning these TOS agreements. There's a flip side to that, too, though, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, as, as Mark, you mentioned, uh, some of the game companies are offering basically broad licenses for non-commercial creativity. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering, if, if the market supports this to a certain extent, the game companies are saying, you know, it's actually a good deal if you go and create non-commercially. Um, one possibility, make that a default rule. So in video games, all non-commercial creativity that's UGC is permissible by law. Politically, maybe possible, but, it's, but it seems like it might be a good idea. Another question is, um, uh, for, maybe for John, um, if you are really excited about a right to create, of use as a kind of fundamental human right to create, does that include commercial creativity? So just to maybe frame this specifically, say there's a, a, a player of a game who wants to post a video on YouTube, of them playing the game, got the full visuals of the game in the game. This is me playing, you know, the game, trying to make money off of it by running ads alongside it. Right. Um, should it be fair use? Well, is it fair use? Should it be fair use? I mean, for me, it goes to have lowering the threshold of what's transformative to uh, a place where you've actually created something new. If you're simply plagiarizing something. Uh, but we are seeing an element of this right now, Twitch TV. So what is Twitch TV? It is people doing walkthroughs of games with voiceovers. Um, so adding some elements, but really you reusing all of the intellectual property that's in the game. Um, and I, I think where that's now being mediated, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I actually am not sure how I feel, my, my instinct is to say, no, you shouldn't be able to make money off of it because that's where the Supreme Court of Canada has sort of come down. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure I truly have analyzed it. But Twitch TV is a current example of exactly that, and money is being made. Where, where I think the twist is, and I'm a little bit more hopeful than Mark is on this point, is that certainly some of the video game companies, and we had some guests from EA in my class this past Wednesday, in fact, and they talked about not wanting to shut down the fans and going to great lengths to do that. And I'll also cite an example that 
hasn't been written about yet, but you may be the perfect guy to write about it. Microsoft Flight Simulator. Every, anybody, everybody must remember that. It was uh, archetypal software for so many years. Microsoft, for years, this may surprise some of you, um, issued the SDK uh, for Microsoft Flight Simulator so that people could build mods, and they allowed those mods to be commercialized. An entire industry involving companies like Abacus and others uh, evolved that made money off of modding M Microsoft Flight Simulator. And Microsoft encouraged it because it, encouraged, it, it made it the, the standard. At a certain point, Microsoft uh, shut down Flight Simulator, uh, decided to take the modding in-house by issuing a new game named Flight, which I think died within three months. And, and Flight Simulator is gone, and the one competitor, which is a tiny little guy from Texas, in fact, um, uh, who does something called X-Plane, is now thriving. And he does, and the mod community has um, reorganized around him. So Austin Meyer. It's like a violation of your golden, you modified golden <laughs> rule, right? There's gold being made. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it comes back to sort of the core component of fair use often in the criticism comment thing. We're talking about the Twitch TVs of the world, the screw attack medias of the world, the um, you know, angry video game nerds of the world, uh, where typically the ones that seem to get by are where there's something else besides just this is the game. I mean, unless you're a media outlet and say you're IGN and you're putting up a walkthrough, which you already have a relationship with those game companies and that's not an issue. You know, if you're putting something else creative into it, often that is a criticism or a commentary or something else within that normal fair use bucket, I don't know that anybody has contested the ability to make money off of that. Uh, it, it's where you get into, again, the things like the flight was a particularly unusual situation, and Microsoft has kind of gone the other way with the content usage rules saying non-commercial, and by the way, you also have to make sure you're not doing any of the following things. And the game has failed. Yeah. So I really wanted to ask you guys about, about Minecraft, but I'm more interested in making sure that everybody has a chance to say something if you have uh, people in the audience who would like to ask questions. And if not, I'll ask about Minecraft. <laughs> there, there are microphones uh, up if you want to. Uh, my name is Richard. Uh, I'm a student at Rutgers. I was curious um, what you guys thought about, uh, and this is for both of you, um, you know, if you know the game System Shock 2, it was in a very interesting place between trademark and copyright, uh, two different owners for each. Um, it was recently put out through Good Old Games, which is an online distribution service, and in the re-release they used mods that the community had made for the past 10 years to run it on newer systems. And in the re-release they didn't credit any of the modders who made these mods and um, my question was should modders who make non-commercial mods for commercial games either have compensation when um, their mods are used commercially by other people or should they have a maybe moral right at least for um, I guess acknowledgement of their contributions because the current version of System Shock 2 wouldn't run on any modern PC if it wasn't for 10 years of work by these modding community. Well, I mean, my answer is pretty simple. Yes, yes, they should have a moral right. There is a case that's very close to this, where uh, the court shut down a company that uh, took 200 user-created uh, um, <coughs> mod levels for what? It was a shooter. It was Duke Nukem. It was Duke Nukem 3D, um, and reissued it. And, uh, and and the, the court uh, found against um, uh, against the company that did that and in favor of the, the producers of, of, of Duke Nukem. Um, I don't consider that a mod case against my argument because the modders uh, were, were not in any way implicated. They, they, they weren't negatively affected by the decision, but the people who did the evil deed that you described rightly were punished. I mean, the, uh, it, the reality is, and this is one of those IGDA topics that comes up all the time, is credits in the games industry is sort of a touchy point anyway. Um, certainly, I wouldn't think there's any reason to not credit the people who created the source code. 
uh, that they're using to make those things work. It then gets back to a how did they release it? You know, did they put it out under some sort of open license? You know, what was it being done with? That's there are things that could fix a lot of those situations and leave no ambiguity. And that's not one that I'm intimately familiar with, so I don't have a direct comment on what exactly happened to those folks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Methanides to unpack a little bit more the hybrid idea and to what extent that uh, solves some of the user problems versus just relocates them to a new uh, place. So on the one hand, it continues to not operate in the fantasy world that if things get into the public domain, they're necessarily totally free game. Um, you know, there, there are so many things that users could do with stuff that's in the public domain that may also be the subject of a trademark that it doesn't change the reality they can't do anything with it because it's already protected by another IP. Uh, what this is really dealing with is that crossover that a lot of people conveniently want to ignore or that they want to continue extending copyright to you know, keep protecting those people. With respect to the users, it's almost more a hedge against that fact that a user can now create something that's so professional that it could actually be confused with the original. Um, and you know, perhaps that's a credit to the users, but you know, if I'm Marvel and somebody's out there creating something with some character that's gotten into the public domain and perhaps is you know, not covered by trademark, I wouldn't want to be confused with that because it was somebody else's content. Um, you know, there, there's a liability issue not only for the company that originally created that, that they could be tied into whatever's going on <laughs> downstream, uh, but not to mention, you know, the potential for dilution, tarnishment, so many of these other things that go back to the core brand, uh, that if, you know, somebody goes out and creates something that's obscene content, you know, you, we've all seen the kind of internet backlash that's occurred over things that are, you know, comparatively minor obscene content that may track back to a particular company indirectly. You know, this would be potentially huge backlash and often difficult to dispel if it's later proven to be somebody else's work. Uh, you know, from the broad standpoint, it doesn't actually help the user, um, other than it, there will theoretically be some sort of similar defined fair use regime that would have to be a hybrid of the copyright and trademark fair uses that would allow those things to be continued to be used within those boundaries. What those boundaries are, I don't know, I haven't written legislation on this, so it's, it's still sort of in a theoretical stage. Can I ask one question about my <laughs> organizers? Um, we're almost, almost out of time. Uh, so Minecraft, it's a UGC you know, feature, it's a huge part of the game, right? Uh, tons of mods, uh, tons of <coughs> videos, right? Um, so it's basically like what you're saying, Microsoft SDK, uh, this is the SDK for a flight simulator. Um, doing incredibly well for itself as a PC-based game. What I'm wondering is, do you think it's uh, a sign of the future? Do you think it's just a continuation of you know, standard practices? This is just an unusual kind of same game. Or do you think it's just kind of a flash in the pan and it's probably not uh, going to move forward as, as a model? It, Minecraft to me is like Lego. I mean, it's a, uh, a great thing that a lot of people can have a lot of fun with, and I can see a lot of things sticking around in that vein for a long time. By the same token, like Lego, you could theoretically create infringing content with Minecraft. So far, we haven't seen a case on that or anything, but uh, who knows what the future might hold. Okay. Um, I, I think Minecraft is part of a changing meme. It's about, it, it's what crowdsourcing is applied to games in a very real way. And it, 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 it I think, changes certainly how I think about games. Um, because, and, and there's a commonality here. If you look at Grand Prix Legends, Microsoft Flight Simulator, and Minecraft, and tracked the amount of content that came from the original developer, and the amount of content that was out there, it would tell you a really telling and interesting story in favor of the right to mod, in a sense. The other thing that I find compelling about Minecraft, to bring it full circle to this room, is it's actually changed how I teach law. I now look at teaching law as providing a territory and an environment that students can um, build mods and build things into rather, and, and that's why, you know, we've got the website going and all of that where students are commenting. 
rather than here's the law, you know, here's the game. No, you will develop the game. I'll try and give you tools. And that's what Minecraft is. And I think that's why it's not only a compelling game, but really where the future is going. And when you look even at things like Ingress, that are so heavily user and player oriented, you know, they just prove the point that without the player, there is no game. Okay, that sounds like a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh